Welcome to Queens County School Board work sessions for March 16th. I do have a motion going to close session. Mr. Smith, pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We'll be returning at five o'clock, thank you. Welcome to Queens County Board of Education, March 6th work session. Can we stand for the pledge? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Matt, if you can't hear, we can turn that thing off. Is that okay? Is that, okay. Thanks. Okay. Have approval agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, the ayes have it. Okay, the first thing will be approval of minutes for March the 2nd closed session. Mr. Smith. Hey, so moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Our next one will be uh, approval of minutes, March 2nd open session. And one thing I noticed on page uh, six, or it's number six, citizen participation, it's Richard McNeil, not Fred McNeil. Okay, I'll fix that, thank you. Mr. Smith, I make a motion to accept the uh, pr uh, amended minutes of uh, March 2nd open session. Second. A motion is second, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, ayes have it, thank you. Uh, next thing will be our minutes for our work session on March the 9th. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Our next thing will be informational items, our blueprint update. Mr. Smith, Dr. Salen, board members and executive team. I'm Matt Kibler, Director of Accountability and Implementation. I uh, also want to introduce too, I have Ms. McNeil here, uh, the Supervisor of Early Childhood. We're going to be talking a little bit about pre-K tonight, so um, in case you throw a question at me that stumps me or something like that, we've got here, <laughs> her here to help us out too. So. Um, I come to you tonight just to bring you some updates on the blueprint for Maryland's future. Um, I did a sort of an introductory presentation in November, and I wanna talk about some, some legislation that's um, on the table right now in Annapolis, as well as talk a little bit about what we've been doing um, to implement the, the blueprint here in Queen Anne's County. Before we get started, just kind of a general overview reminder. Uh, the blueprint has these five main policy areas, early childhood education, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, college and career readiness pathways, which includes the CTE, more resources to ensure all students are successful, and governance and accountability. Tonight, really, um, I wanna focus on just some general updates, um, the big, sort of big happenings around what they're calling the comprehensive imp implementation plans, the timeline specifically, as well as some work we're doing around pre-K. Just to start with um, general updates, one thing I've done since we first met on this topic back in November is I reached out to all of my counterparts um, on the Eastern Shore, our ESMEC counties, and organized monthly meetings with that group um, just so we can kind of get together, uh, ask each other questions. Hey, are you all interpreting this piece of the law like we are? What, it, what are you all thinking? And it's really not about standardizing what we're doing or anything like that. It's just, it's nice to have a, a, a set of resources and colleagues that we can kind of talk through these and that's been very beneficial. And I know um, others are doing that as well, not just around the blueprint, but that's been helpful so far. We also meet monthly um, as blueprint coordinators. So all 24 jurisdictions, we have that. 
and the MSDE just started recently. I think we've had two meetings um, so far where all the blueprint coordinators also meet with uh, represent representation from MSDE, and that's been helpful. Um, if you remember sort of the, the state um, overarching um, governing body of this is the Accountability and Implementation Board, the AIB. They've been present at a few of our meetings. Um, I had the opportunity to, to meet with an AIB member with other Eastern Shore counties a few weeks ago, which was really helpful. We could kind of share some of our concerns, hear what they're thinking. So um, it, it's been, it's been great so far. We have, Dr. Salen started last summer, a blueprint advisory work group within the district make the, made up of all kinds of stakeholders, um, sort of internal stakeholders and in the community and from the commissioner's office. We've slowed down those meetings a little bit. They were meeting monthly starting last summer. We've moved it back to roughly every other month and it's, I think that'll become evident why when we get into the comprehensive, um, the comprehensive implementation plan timeline. We've actually been advised to slow those groups down by both MABE and um, the AIB themselves um, because some of these things are starting to slow down and what they don't want us to do is go too far down in some of these policy areas and have to reverse course later on. And then the one area we really are working on is we have a local pre-K uh, blueprint work group that we've been uh, meeting roughly every other week, sometimes once a month. And we're gonna talk about the three-year plan we have um, for expanding access to pre-K in a few minutes. But to start, uh, I wanna talk about the um, comprehensive implementation plan. This slide's a little busy. Um, what's really important in the middle are the dates of February 15th, April 1st, and June 15th. Initially with the blueprint, all districts in Maryland would have to submit a comprehensive implementation plan for the entire blueprint. Blueprint. Oh. Hope I don't struggle through that the rest of the night. <laughs> but um, by June 15th of this year, the first step to that was the Accountability and Implementation Board letting us know what those plans need to entail by February 15th. On April 1st, we were supposed to get a rubric for that. There's been delays in getting the AIB up and running. You can see sort of some issues above those dates. The AIB didn't get their first employee until February 7th. Mm -hmm. They are to hire 15 total employees and they don't expect to have that permanent staff in place until this summer. So really these plans, we've gotten no guidance and they're just it's just not gonna be possible to get this done. So moving on, there's a current house bill, it's 1450, it's being reviewed. And that's going to delay the comprehensive implementation plan and it's roughly moving the timeline back nine months. The key dates to that are September 1st, we would get the rubric from MSDE of what needs to be in the timeline plan. Um, December 1st, the AIB would tell us what they're looking for, how they want it um, sort of formatted. And then we wouldn't actually turn it in until March 15th of 2023. So that gets delayed from June 15th this year to March 15th next year. And the next bullet is kind of interesting with that. Delaying the implementation plan at this point does not delay any of the pieces within the blueprint. For those of us who don't know what AIB means. That's the Accountability and Implementation Board. They're the governing, so they're, they've been, they're named in the law to sort of oversee the implementation of this in this state. They were created as a accountability board to, um, instead of MSDE. So it's really the governor's way of um, having a second hand. Checks and balances. Yes, yes. There's seven members appointed by the governor. They serve staggered terms. And they're, they have their own employees. They will. They have their own budget that's paid out of MSDE? No. Directly from the state? Directly from the state. I, I didn't know, I didn't read No, that. no, that's fine. I and didn't one read of, the 3,000 pages of it. I didn't realize what was going on. And I read that for you. Thank you, I'm, I'm so glad. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's delaying the AIB is, um, 
is just their funding. Funding for this is tied to um, sports betting, and that's been slow to get up and running. Really? Imagine. Um, now you're saying seven members. Isn't that the issue we have, that they're not necessarily spread across the state either? Correct. Is there anybody on the shore? There is not. Anybody on the western shore? I'm, I'm sorry, western Maryland? No, Fred, there's not. So everybody's in the central part of the state? They actually come, I believe, four from... Four different. Yeah, it's four different only four different districts. And I think, is this the General Assembly addressing that issue, or...? One thing that they're trying to get up and running are basically, um, and I, excuse me if I say the name wrong, but sort of like an advisory panel, um, which would, in, they would make sure to, they would be advisors to every policy area, and they would have cross-representation, they would make sure from every um, district. So the seven members could all, there, there's no districts or regions or anything done by that. It's just you could all be from wherever they decide. They could all be from one district. So there'd be an advisory board to the AIB advisory board. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's another interesting well, piece. Welcome to Maryland. I think that um, the board may have seen, or I, I know, I, I think Pre uh, President Smith was definitely um, copying on it, that the commissioners actually wrote a letter um, asking that that be changed and modified so that there was uh, some representation, one seat from the shore. So um, I don't know that, that anything's been acted on as it relates to that, but I know that they, they actually made um, a statement that supported They're, that. They were tossing around the idea of, so the staggered terms, do they amend that and, and attach with the staggered terms the different regions across the state to be represented? That would be, I don't know, maybe, maybe one way to do it. Would be fair. I mean, with seven members, I would think both the Eastern Shore and the Western, sh and when I say Western, I'm talking Western Maryland, mm -hmm. should have some kind of representation because they're, they're different different animals and different yep. size school. I mean, our school systems on the shore are very small compared to the ones in, on the, in the, you know. And I, I would, if, if it's okay, I can go back to something I said before. The AIB members themselves recognize this. Like, they, they understand that they were appointed and they are from right there in Central Maryland, and that's why one member reached out to us on the shore and agreed and came to a two-hour meeting with us and extended the invitation to come back and gave us his contact information to share concern. So um, I do I do appreciate that and would like to just make that public. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. So this slide gets a little e even busier. It's why I added before. The, these, this comes from the actual AIB public presentation when they met, but this just sort of puts um, those dates, those new dates, the September 22 date, the December date, and next March 23 on paper. One thing that the AIB is proposing is that rather than us just in June of this year, like it was supposed to be saying, hey, here's our comprehensive implementation plan, read it over, tell us what you think, accept it or not, ask for changes. What they're proposing is that as we get into the summer and fall and they start working on what it's going to look like, that they would actually extend the offer, offer for work sessions with them as they're developing what the comprehensive plan should look like, where we would almost be working on our plans at the district level, knowing what they're going to put out to us so that when we hand our plans in next March, we essentially know that it's approved at that time. Um, I like that idea in theory. We will want to be careful that it doesn't make us all standardized doing the exact same thing across the state, that we're still having that local authority to do what makes sense for Queen Anne's County. Um, but that's what they're thinking right now. And MSDE is supportive of that as well. It would be sort of the LEAs with MSDE and the AIB work. And can you make that happen without the rubric at this point? So if what's interesting about what they've done with this new timeline is they've switched the order where they're going to give us the rubric first. So the rubric is what we would receive in September. And they, they're saying that they would want our input over the summer as well as they're starting to develop that. I have no reason to, to think that they won't do that. They've been very receptive. They want to come to our meetings. They're asking for seats at our meetings. They want us to be in touch with them, want to know what questions we have. Hmm. 
Any question, other questions on the timeline? Uh, the, the only other piece I would say is what they're saying that where I mentioned that they're not moving the other pieces of the blueprint back right now, just the comprehensive plan. What they'd like to do is while they're working on the comprehensive plan, if they encounter dates that they think are going to put an undue burden on districts are just unreasonable, they will then take up and push those dates back at that time. One thing that um, a bunch, a, a lot of us on the executive team and Dr. Salins have heard is like the CCR timeline. We're expecting that timeline to be pushed back a year, maybe two, hopefully two. <laughs> there and I um, so I, I would say too that House Bill 1450 when it was brought up for its first sort of debate I, I'm sorry I might not know the correct terminology there were no comments to it there were really no objections I think everybody recognizes that getting that AIB um, sort of the delay in that setup that that's necessary so I'm not anticipating any any issues with getting that delayed yeah. I kind of want to go back to the CCR, the college sure. worker ready. Yes, um, you know, I want to explain that in the blueprint, and as we follow through with that, students who would not be would not uh, earn that designation would then have to do coursework. And the reason that we're asking them to push that back is because we don't have that coursework developed right now. So, and, and we've already we've already scheduled. So we can't schedule kids for next year, students for next year, into courses that haven't been developed at the right. state level. So that's the ask. I don't want anybody to think that we don't want all of our students to be college and career ready. And that right now, students who aren't maybe meeting that mark that we're not providing other supports through other means, especially as it relates to tutoring and things like that. So we are doing all those things. It's just that coursework. So that's why we're asking. I just wanted to clarify that because um, I think that's important that nobody thinks that, you know, as, as uh, leaders and districts that we don't think that students should be college and career ready or that we don't support that. It's just that that timeline isn't possible to meet considering how we schedule students. Kind of hard with their own timeline not being quick. Right, exactly. Yeah, basically, we're asking, all the districts are asking, let us keep doing what we have been doing. Right, to and support just, students right. and their achievement. <clears throat> okay, so we move on to um, the next thing that I'm excited about this, and I hope, hope you all too are too, um, talking about pre-K expansion and how that relates to the blueprint. And you'll, you'll hear me continue to call this pre-K expansion, and I think it's really important that we all call it pre-K expansion, even though um, you, you might see in, in the blueprint or, or people talking about the blueprint, this the universal pre-K. Um, Universal pre-K makes makes folks instantly think that we're going to have unlimited spots for everybody that that's age appropriate for pre-K, and that that is really not what this is doing right now. This is expanding access to pre-K, and what we're going to sort of walk you through here is a three-year plan to get all of our elementary schools up to offering a a full-day program. <laughs> Um, but again, not for all students yet. Um, just what, you know, just stepping it up. We have half day programs at four schools, two schools are full day right now. But at the end of this three years, we would have every school at least offering a full day program. So what you're saying is you're just opening up for a full day program, but not changing where there'll be hopefully more students, but that everybody still will not, there could still be a lottery or however we do that by level. Correct. It'll still be There's tied to income criteria, level. There's right, a set by of income, criteria, right, by income, set of criteria. So it's not going to be open up for everybody. No, they, unless there was um, additional seats and that those right. who were eligible didn't take it and then we still had additional seats. Um, but Matt's going to talk about the 300% rule and the 180% rule and what that means because it is it is actually very complicating. And, and when I think of universal pre-K, I think of pre-K for every student mm -hmm. whoever would like to participate. And, yep. and really that's not, if you read more in depth into the blueprint, it, there's always a, a, a set of criteria by which people are um, eligible for that opportunity. But wasn't it, it was on poverty level and need? 
Is it going to change that way? It, it, it increases the income level from the 180, 185% to 300%. So it will uh, give more access, okay. be less restrictive in that and sense. And can you give an example so somebody can understand that? Because that is very complicated for people to sure, understand. Sure. So let me use a number I can do quick in my head. Okay. <laughs> So I think when I, I, the numbers I've been roughly using, so like the 300% poverty level, I think, I, I believe in, I think it was fiscal year 21, the uh, poverty level in Queen Anne's County was around $25,000 for a family of four. So this 300% would mean if a family of four earns less than $75,000, they would qualify um, for their student to have a spot in that pre-K class if we, had, if we had an opening. We're not required to take them. There is a 185% requirement in Comar right now that if you're at 185% of the, of the poverty level, we have to provide at least a half day program. And that's what we're currently doing. And we will be able to continue meeting that with this plan. So the half day at 185, let's say it's $45,000 for a family of four. Yes. Whatever mm -hmm. the number. And it, it, it could go up to 75000 Yeah, But exactly. it's going to cut down on you know, our, our plans. But we're also looking to have more seats exactly. in the schools. Exactly. So, but we'll still but be able still to still not going to be 100% across the board. And the wealth of Queen Anne's County does leave a lot of those people out. Exactly. <laughs> Eventually, in the, in the blueprint, um, there's, there's another scale for 300 to 600% where there's like a sliding scale of, of how much funding we would get per student, but we'll talk about that at another time. That doesn't start for a few years. Right now, what's what's on the table is this 300% mark. So we're not for, gonna be allowed to add the pre-K numbers to our overall student numbers in order to get MOE? Well, that's the, next, that's the next part, how the funding is working for this, and partly why we have to go slow. So the timing is based on previous year's enrollment. So our pre-K funding for next year is based on the number of full day spots we have as of September 30th, 2021. Okay. So, But we won't get that money until next fiscal year. 2023. Hmm. And it's, so that's partly why we can't do all of this at once. We have to go slow. And when somebody yeah, registers for pre-K, <laughs> for pre-K, they bring in financial information or something how to qualify for that. It's not, it's not like it's not related to our free and reduced lunches. It's 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 a pre-qualification that you yes. come in three or six months earlier, show your whatever your financial issues that has to be done. And I think we're just starting pre-K for yeah. next now. year registration. Yeah, pre-K registration will be starting in April. Um, and um, I told her I'd bring her a chair up. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, um, it is a little different than the farms um, application that is at the beginning of the year. They do have to submit either their W-2s or a month's, um, the current month's pay stubs. And then based off of that, um, it, we total it up and then we compare it to the federal poverty level charts to see what percentage they fall in. Um, so it, it's something we've always done because we had to determine our 185s and below, um, but we are increasing and asking that everyone complete this because we, we need to start tracking to see how many families we need that we're growing to. Um, and we, of course, we have that 300% now that we need to look at. So um, when they come to registration, they can fill out the form and then um, submit the required documentation, um, but that is from the state as well that that's required in order because then in order to get the funding we have to prove when they come to do an audit that we had evidence um, of their income but the w-2 so do we ask is there anything else tied into it so yes social security disability absolutely yes support, so um, the form does ask for all sources of income um, that they have to include we also include their case number if they receive um, any other additional income through the federal programs um, and their letter of approval and they have to show the children that are listed um, on that. So they do have to show every income and it's the income of everyone living in the house. So even if you know there's additional family members living in that home, they have to provide 
um, income for those families. As it well. can go up if there's more in the household than four. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So we like when we get the paperwork, we count how many people are living in the house, and we just keep going over on the scale until we reach what the total income is, and that's where we find out where their percent where they fall in the percentage scale um, with it. So we did use the 300% um, these last two years with our pre-K threes that we had. This will be the first year that the 300% will expand to our pre-K fours. Um, but as Matt said, you know, we're only required by the state to continue the 185% that all of our 185% receive at least a half day pre-K program. So that's great. So we've been able to meet that need at 185, 100, you know, across the board and we've maybe we've been able right. to add some 300 we, with absolutely fours. so in the past we have um our second tier was always our academic needs so after we had all our 185s in if we had spots still available um, there's an assessment that the students take when they come for registration and then we kind of rake them um, in that category um, but now we have that extra piece of the income to look at as well so um but on top of income all of our students that have IEPs or um, their um, home language is English by filling out the home language, I mean Spanish or another language, sorry, not just Spanish, um, filling out the home language survey, they become automatics as well. So not based on income. So there's two other student groups that get in prior to um, income. And is that a mandatory that we have to do that or is that? Yes, that's that from the state. Pay? That's okay. Yep, in order to receive the funding, we have to allow students with IEPs and um, students that complete the home language survey um, saying they their um, home language is other than English, then um, they get in, they become our tier ones as well as our 185s. So, but as a county, we've done really good getting in all of, all of those students across the board. I was gonna say, and even when we had extra seats, I know we've been able to fill most of those. We don't, did we have one school that where we didn't uh, have everybody? Um, um, this school year. We had yeah, one this, school, right? Yeah, here. one school this school year had to turn away um, some students. Um, but in the past, we've had several schools, um, especially large population like um, Centerville and Ken I, um, but I think with the pandemic, less people had um, signed up and registered um, for pre-K. Um, but we did have a school that had almost a full class slide that we had to turn away. Um, but that's one of our schools we're going to expand on. So we're excited about that. So. When we do this, we provide, they ride the bus, I'm assuming, with the elementary Correct. school. Correct. And then there's another bus, if there's a half day, that leaves Correct. at noon. Now, we'll, I guess we're figuring all that in with Mr. Pender as far as additional transportation. Absolutely. So our work group that um, we have involves um, Sid and um, also, you know, because as we go into this three-year plan that he's going to share, it's also looking at building size and space. So, you know, we Lunch have room Carla. Space. Huh? Lunch room space. Yeah. Um, and it's also schedules, you know, meeting with the principals to see how implementing a full day impacts the schedules, their lunch shifts. Oh, yeah, um, you're, you're yeah. so gym, there, gym there is a large group of us that do meet um, monthly or sometimes every other week here um, just with the people involved in making this work to make decisions. We just had one this week, you know, and talking about you know, our first year of expanding, what does that look like for furniture? Where can we borrow? You know, there's a lot of things um, to think about when we're, you know, starting to expand. And that's why it's more of an expansion versus, you know, let's just throw out there everybody because it is going to take some funding and we need to build up our full day spots in order to get the funding back to continue our expansion. Yeah, yeah. So, um, because there's other requirements that we, in order to get the funding, have to follow. Sorry. No, that's great. <laughs> Just sort of continuing on that theme, you, you can see on this slide, by, by 25, 26, when the blueprint is sort of fully implemented for the pre-K piece, um, each of our pre-K classrooms will have to have Excel's level five accreditation. 
um, the teachers will have to be certified teachers and the, uh, the classroom assistance uh, requirements are going to go up as well. They have to either have an associate's degree or a, a CDA certification. So that's new. So in the meantime, sort of getting there to get us to the full blueprint um, implementation, the grant opportunities that are out there, the pre-K expansion grant, that gives us money that we actually get in the current year where we're expanding. For any half-day spot, we're turning into a full-day spot. The one which is great, the disadvantage to that is the school already has to have that Excel's level five accreditation. So we can go on to the next slide and talk about the schools. We can only use that grant in one of the schools next year. And then the transitional funds is how we're doing the rest of, of the plan here. And, and the, the uh, assistant certifications, we're trying to go about that in a regional manner so that it's not a burden on any one district um, to provide um, you know, either reduced costs or no costs to some of the employees so that they can get that. And the state just surveyed us because they're going to provide us some money as well. So, so they have shared with us. It won't cost our employees anything to get that certification. And we'll try to minimize the burden on them to do that. So the districts that work with uh, Chesapeake College, we're trying to get a meeting set up in the next couple weeks with them to talk about what that, that could look like to help our assistants. So we can all kind of be on the same page. So that's that ESMEC group that we organized. You know, just one of the benefits of that. So again, this three-year plan we're talking about, that, that was kind of the background information. Here's what we're thinking. Um, this will have every school offering full day pre-K for our four-year-olds by the end of the next three years or three years when we start next year. Currently, we only have a full day program at Church Hill in Sudlersville. Year one next year, uh, we're going to talk about expanding at Mattapeak Elementary. They currently have one classroom, a teacher and an assistant that teach a half day program. So that school will still have one classroom, but that classroom will go from half day to full day. So again, we're not really talking about serving any more students at Mattapeak next year, but they'll be at the full day requirement. Graysonville Elementary School, right now they have one teacher and one assistant that teach two half-day classes, so a class in the morning, a class in the afternoon. We're gonna add a teacher and an assistant there so that each of those classes become full day. So again, no additional students at Graysonville next year, um, but the school will be up to a full day program. And then at Church Hill, because they are a school and there's a need up there, they have the level of uh, Excel's accreditation. We can use pre-K expansion there and add a pre-K four room. In year two, we would expand at Kent Island Elementary. They again have the one teacher and assistant with the two half day classes similar to Graysonville. And then in year three, um, would be adding at Centerville Elementary. In year three, we have Centerville because they have the largest issue with space. I mean, they're at capacity now. They're the biggest elementary school we have. Correct. So again, just so everybody knows, this three-year plan is not universal pre-K or what we've all come to sort of think in our head what universal pre-K is. It's expanded access and it will get us the full day at all six of the elementary schools. Um, Blueprint also addresses pre-K three. This current plan doesn't have us addressing pre-K three-year-olds. We feel it's more important to get the pre-K four full day programs at all the schools up and running first and then hopefully expanding the number of students eventually that we're um, working with in all of the schools as well. If any, if any of you have sort of looked in about any of the legislation with the blueprint, the blueprint also talks about local um, education agencies working with private providers as well. We don't have in Queen Anne's County any private providers that have the level five Excel's accreditation. So really we have no providers to sort of share, share this pre-K expansion with at this time. If any of them would make that uh, decision to try to go for that, we would be willing to work with them, but at this time, and that's across the state, that's not just um, unique to Queen Anne's County. The number the number of um, sort of private providers that are thinking about doing this is not um, 
not matching up with sort of what the initial spirit of the blueprint was, I think. And part of this three-year plan, what this gives us time, it gives us time to do this right. It gives us time to get our accreditation at all of these schools up and running. Accreditation is, is not easy to do. Um, works on staffing so we can staff these schools um, appropriately, not try to do it all at once. The funding, again, with the lag, this allows us to do this responsibly. Responsibly, excuse me. And the other thing we could do, depending on funding, um, we could add rooms in some of these schools that we're talking about in this three-year plan over the next three years. If things are going great, additional funds, we know we have pre-K teachers available and assistance. You know, if we wanted to add a room, that nothing says we can't do that as well. But right That's now, space. this is the current thing. <laughs> And you got to try to be equitable across the right. whole system. And even though some schools will be more adaptable to space, some are, are going to really have big issues. Right. So the big thing is we're going to full day kindergarten. Pre K. Pre K. I'm pre -K. sorry. Pre K. Yeah. Full day pre K. Fours. Fours. Four year olds. Four year olds. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not open, it's not universal. It's it's still got the level, so it's not like everybody's going to be coming in. It's going to expand some, but it's not for everybody. Right. So, Correct. I mean, I think that's the big thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a misconception right there, because mm -hmm. you know when you see this expansion, you just think, okay, next year, and it's a three year in here with you're talking about you know three schools this year, one school and another school. So it's. Uh, I think it's a good way to go. I don't think we can just take it all on in one year, but uh, it's interesting. I have a question about Churchill, though, because you're saying Churchill currently has full day pre-K, but you're wanting to add another room for pre-K four? Because the changes in the 300% rule will make more students okay. eligible okay. and would provide, and we have the space to be able to do it. So that would that do would, it in Southersville the, too? The other piece of that with Churchill specifically is because of the pre-K expansion grant and they already have the level five accreditation, oh. we'll get funding for that room next year in that fiscal year. Okay. Oh, that room cool. won't, won't be delayed a year. So it makes it a little bit... Um, Cleaner and with the 185 and 300, which is 45,000 income to 75 somewhere in that area, Northern County is going to be more affected than it's going to be on Ken Island. Yep. You know, it's going to be, you know, so I can see where Churchill will probably and Sumter so will be more than. Well, the initial pre-K expansion grant did not start as a 300, and that's why our Northern County so is already under the expansion grant because it truly was for the 185 and below to provide full day programs. It was to allow us to move from half day slots to full day slots. Um, so now, you know, with the poverty level changing of the grant, um, you know, to the 300, it allows us to expand in other areas of our county. But when this grant started um, under Susan Walver, you know, it, it was that 185. Um, and that's why we it initially started at Sellersville Elementary. Plus, they also had a Judy Center already tied to them, which helps with accreditation. And um, and then uh, Churchill was brought into it along with a Judy Center, which helped with accreditation. So um, they've had those supports in place that allowed them. Um, but in order to use the pre-K expansion grant, you have to be already accredited. We know we turned away almost a full class of students from Churchill, so why not take that, you know, where we have accreditation and build that second class for them um, to allow them to have two classrooms there. So, and Sellersville's been doing great with just the three classrooms. They've been able to service the students that need to be served um, at Sellersville, and they had the space for it, so really just not a teacher when you're talking about adding the rooms it's the furniture it's the, yeah. the space it's the transportation so. and did you want to just while you touched on the Judy Center piece of it and accreditation oh, did you want me to talk, talk about, about that yeah I might as well I mean um, okay. you know give a little uh, grace and bill update sure. for us. Um, yeah so um, a lot of the Judy centers are tied to title one schools um, and that's going to be changing too that they want to build more Judy centers at the schools um, so in order to do that, they have to take away that requirement. But um, we are going to apply to, um, and it's a competitive grant, so it's not guaranteed, but we are applying to have a Judy Center at Graysonville. Um, so that will help them to start also in the accreditation process because 
at year 2026, all of our schools, in order to continue to get the funding, we have to have everyone accredited. Um, so it's it's a big process, and um, you know it was something the state used to do. Then they took it away, and it was only those who were funded under pre-K expansion. And now it's bringing it back that you know everyone will have to go through accreditation, and the Judy Centers play a big part of that accreditation because part of it is the home and community connection, and our Judy Centers um, support us in many ways in that connection. So um, if we can build another Judy Center, have another Judy Center available for our families, um, you know, we're Do we hoping. have space at Graysonville for that Judy Center? Yeah, they, um, Graysonville does have some spaces to increase to have an additional pre-K room as well as the Judy Center um, tied with it. And, we've and been part of that process, so I feel yeah. confident that we know, you know, we've been through it, so now we know what we need to do. Yes. And it won't be quite, it's still difficult. The process is very taxing, but I feel confident that the staff is, mm -hmm. you know, up for the challenge and can absolutely get through the accreditation. Yeah, so we plan to accredit the them um, this coming year, Grace and Bill to work with the pre-K team and Judy Center to get them accredited. That'll give us three buildings accredited out of the six. And with their knowledge and everything going through accreditation, we can support the other three schools because they will not have Judy Centers tied to them, but we'll know what we need to in do, order right. to help them um, get their accreditation by 2026. So the focus of our pre-K work group now as we meet into the summer is gonna be really talking about space. As, as we talk about expanding spots eventually, the number of students we're serving. What we really need to hear is money instead <laughs> of unfunded, unfunded mandates as we have for the last 20 years. That was one of the concerns you probably brought to IEB, right, was the <laughs> lack of funding. Oh, yes. Of of always. Initiatives, yes. We've had unfunded mandates, for, you know, since they got invented. That's right. <laughs> it's crazy. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Good questions. Board? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Very Thanks. helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have no board action items. A couple things. Everybody had in front of them a school board meeting schedule for next year. Everybody just take a look at that over the next couple of weeks, and we're going to put that on the meeting uh, for uh, April. Um, a couple things I see, July the 6th, you know, it's July the 4th, we've got that issue, we've got December 21st, the work session. If, ever, if all the board members could just, uh, you know, come up with some ideas uh, of how we want to do this, and then we'll look at it next uh, meeting. And uh, The only thing I would recommend on the July 6th sir, is there's a lot of things that have to be procured um, at that meeting. There's a lot of procur procurements that has been roughly in the past. To get ready for the school year. Yeah. Uh, we could do them in the work session in June. That would be great if they're. Mm -hmm. if and and they we know. you know move the meeting to the thirteenth to, to, to the thirteenth and stop the twentieth or something. You know what I mean? We can everybody can come up with your ideas of what you think. Okay. Um, I just think being July the fourth is a close one. Then I look down here on December the twenty first yeah. um, mm -hmm. as a work session. Is that you know? And we can you know it's a it's it, we can change this, but it's just an overall thing. What we need, we got some. Uh, budget work sessions in January, February, like we usually do. Um, just everybody take a look at it, take some time to it, and see how everybody feels on it. Um, the other thing is, um, I stop by and get my things on Friday or Monday uh, printed. If any board members, uh, Carrie, uh, prints out stuff for me to print them out, you know, agendas, because I think all the agendas are supposed to be set by Friday um, for everybody to understand what's going on. I know some members look at it over the weekend. So, you know, get in touch with them and we'll just say, I think, is there some kind of courier thing we can get? If somebody needs something, they can get it to them. Don't we have, you know, so if anybody needs that or whatever, just send, you know, or send to me and do whatever we want to do. Our next meeting will be our regular scheduled meetings on March the 6th, our regular school board meeting, and we have another April. work. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Just. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What's my Time's going by. Said March, and it's really April. Next day. April, April will be crazy? April the 6th, yeah. and then we have our work session on April the 20th. Any other board members have anything for this evening? Nope. nope. Okay, we are going to go back into closed session. I make a motion to adjourn open session and to reconvene closed session. Second. Motion second. Also, you say aye. Aye. Ayes have it.
Thank you.